America. We're talking today with Doug Bukema of Hudsonville, Michigan, and the interviewer is James Smither of the Grand Valley State University Veterans History Project. Now, Doug, can you start us off with some background yourself, and to begin with, where and when were you born? I was born on August 25th, 1946, in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and uh, I grew up in the Grand Rapids area. I grew up in Wyoming, actually Wyoming Park, went to Wyoming Park High School, okay. graduated in 64. And what did your family do for a living when you were growing up? Uh, my dad had various jobs, but he ended up working for an office furniture manufacturer in, in Grand Rapids. And uh, my mother was basically uh, a stay-at-home mom until mm -hmm. we got older, and then she worked for the, the assessor's office for the city of Wyoming. Okay, and how many kids were in the family? We have four boys. I'm the oldest of four boys. All right. Uh, now, uh, what did you do when you finished high school? I actually worked for a year first, and then I went to Davenport for a couple of years. And, uh, and then I wasn't going to go back to school. And this is, uh, I graduated in 64 from high school. And so uh, I think I worked for a year first, then I went to Davenport for a couple of years. Uh, and then I wasn't going to go back to school. And the, and the Selective Service wanted to know what was my status. Mm -hmm. And so I went down to the Selective Service, and they wanted to know if I was going back to school in the fall. And I said, no. And uh, they said I would probably be drafted. And they didn't know exactly when I would be drafted. Uh, she said, unless you want, to, you want to volunteer for the draft. Now, then we can tell you exactly what time you got to be down in the bus depot, what date. Mm -hmm. And so I said, well, let's do it that way. So I volunteered for the draft, but it wasn't because it was the patriotic thing to do. Mm -hmm. I did it at the time because then I knew exactly when I'd be going. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Now, at the point, now, when was that then? What year? That was August of 67. Okay. I think I stepped forward, your left foot forward mm -hmm. when you joined, actually, you know, uh, it was August 7th. 67. All right. Now, at that point, uh, did you know much of anything about what was going on over in Vietnam? Yeah, I knew some, somewhat, but I didn't know exactly at the time it was building up and whatever. And this was before the Tet of 68 mm -hmm. and all that. So, uh, yeah, I knew a little bit, but not a whole lot. All right. Uh, okay. So you, you, you put your foot forward, you join the military. What do they do with you then once you sign up or get signed well, up? Well, I went, I went to Fort Knox. Mm -hmm. um, and I did my, my basic training at Fort Knox. And uh, I was actually, because I was taller, I was a squad leader. That's how they picked squad leaders at the time. And in the barracks, they had four squads, one platoon in a barracks, four squads. And, uh, and I was the squad leader. And we got out of uh, um, basic training after eight or nine weeks. And then I went to Fort McClellan, Alabama. OK. Now let's fill in a little bit the basic training experience itself. You get down to Fort Knox, uh, did they bus you down there, or how did that work? Um, I think we actually took a train mm -hmm. from Detroit. I, uh, when I joined, you know, my st mm -hmm. stepping forward and stepping into the thing, you did that in Detroit area. So yeah. Now, Army yeah. And did you do your physical in Detroit or at Fort Knox? Physical was in Detroit way before I ever went there. Okay. Yeah. Now, when you did the physical, were there people there trying to do things to get out of the oh, military? Sure. Oh, sure. What sort of stuff were they trying? Um, as you're standing there in your underwear, uh, let's move the line up, let's move the line, you know, that kind of thing. Jokingly, and mm -hmm. sometimes, I don't know if it was jokingly, you know. And also, uh, what I remember about being in Detroit then, I remember uh, the Detroit River and looking across to Canada. Mm -hmm. And uh, and later on, that, that came in because I know a lot of people went to Canada trying mm -hmm. to get out of the draft. So. All right. Uh, but on the whole, though, were most of the people who came there, they just get processed, they move on? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, now, you get down to Fort Knox, and what kind of reception do you get there? Um, the drill sergeant, um, you know, from, from the train station, I guess, we took a bus mm -hmm. and uh, get into Fort Knox, and the drill sergeant came in, and he uh, uh, gave us an introduction that, you know, uh, most people don't forget, I guess, you know, and he tells us that uh, he's your mother and your father, and like you've seen in some of the pictures, I'm sure, some of the movies, uh, it's pretty much, that was pretty much realistic the way they did that then. And so uh, then we got assigned to a barracks and we went, to the, went our ways, you know. Mm -hmm. Now how easy or hard was it for you to make that adjustment to military life? Um, it was fairly easy for me. Um, I think attitude means a lot, and I had a good attitude about it, and I, I just, uh, and I was also in pretty good shape at that time, mm -hmm. and so uh, I just approached it like, um, I'll play their game with them. If they want to play games, I'll play the game with them, so. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so they made you a squad leader. I guess, well, yeah. Of course, you were tall, too, so. Okay. That's what really made it, yeah. All right, uh, but you get through that. Now, how much physical training do they give you 
and, and basic. Well, we did a lot of physical training. I don't remember how many hours a day, but we did a lot of marches and that type of thing, and, and double time, you know. Uh, we did quite a bit of that, actually. But I remember the field marches. You go on uh, two big hills at Fort Knox were uh, a misery and agony, I think. And we had to go up these big hills and down the other side and whatever. And, and they were like, they called them field marches, I guess. And they were like 14 miles or 16 miles or something to that effect mm -hmm. with all your gear and whatever. So. And were there guys who physically couldn't handle it? There were, yep. What happened with them? Um, they used to have an ambulance sitting back that would trail everybody and they'd bring them to the infirmity or, or what, you know, I don't, I don't know where they took mm -hmm. them actually to the hospital or whatever, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah, there were some people that couldn't make it. And then would they come back or just get cycled into the next class or just disappear? Um, some of them actually got discharged because uh, I remember they could not adjust to military life is what we heard. All of a sudden somebody would be gone, you know, mm -hmm. so. And I really don't know what happened to all of them. I don't remember. Right. Okay. Now, were there people who were acting up or trying to push back against the system? Yes. There were some. And um, I remember one guy in basic training who um, actually kind of lost it. And he picked up a footlocker and threw it all the way across the barracks. And, uh, and they came and put him in a straitjacket and took him away. And I don't know what happened to him. Right. Uh, I heard he was one that could not adjust to military life. Mm -hmm. you know, so. All right. And, and what kind of mix of people were in there? I mean, were they all pretty much from, from one area or a region? I, or I think most of them at, at basic were from the one region, you know, one, one generally Midwest. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, what was the racial mix? Were they mostly white or? Um, mostly white, I would guess maybe uh, 10, 15 percent black mm -hmm. and maybe some Puerto Rican and, and Mexican and that type. But yeah, mostly white. Okay. All right. Uh, you, you get through your basic training. What happens to you then at that point? I ended up going to Fort McClellan. Well, I got more orders to go to Fort McClellan, Alabama. And uh, that was our AIT, Advanced Infantry Training. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess I went down there first, and then when I got there, I found out I had to go to a different school. It's called Leadership Preparation Course, I think, LPC. And, uh, and so I did that, and I think that was only a week or two weeks long. And then I went to AIT, or Advanced Infantry Training, as a squad leader again. Mm -hmm. Now, was there an expectation here that you were going to become a non-commissioned officer, or no one's telling you anything right now? No, I didn't know a thing at that time yet. Okay. Well, what did the leadership training consist of? Was that um, how to be a squad leader? Or? I guess basically just how to be a leader, I guess, mm -hmm. and, and lead by example and that type of thing. You know, it's been a long time, and I really don't remember all of it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and it, it was only a week. It was only a week long or so. Right. Now, how was AIT different from basic? AIT was more specialized because now um, I was going to be in the infantry, okay? Um, and so it was more specialized as far as uh, uh, weapons and that type of thing, how to clean your weapon, how to shoot, and, and how, to, how to lead a squad, and, and how to, the, different, the different parts of the team, you know, of the squad. Okay. What kind of weapons were you trained on? Um, I trained on, um, well, of course, we started with the M14. And we also did the M16 and uh, uh, the M60 machine gun, uh, M72 law, uh, M79 grenade launcher, and uh, a 50 caliber. We fired 50 calibers in training, and that was all. You know, they had the butterfly trigger, and, and that's the only time we ever fired those. So. Okay. Uh, did you get to work with mortars, or was that? A I did. I actually, uh, I was actually training in mortars at the time, uh, and that's the difference between your MOS 11 Bravo and 11 Charlie. 11 Charlie is mortars, mortars. Mm -hmm. and so, you know, they work together basically, but, but I actually trained in mortars also, and when I went to Nam um, a few months later, uh, I thought I was going to go into mortars, and when I got over there, they said, no, you're not in mortars, you're infantry. Mm -hmm. So, All right. Uh, now, uh, when you're in AIT, do you get any time off here and there, or can you leave the base or anything like that? We did. We had some weekend passes, and, uh, and I remember I went with a, a gentleman from Grand Rapids area, Ken Tepper, uh, and, and, uh, and we had Dwayne Vandenbosch. We had other guys. But anyway, uh, we went into town and, uh, and did various things on our weekend pass. But I also became friends at the time, and I'm still lifelong friends with this guy, 
Ken Turner from Smyrna, Georgia, um, because his home was within our 150 mile radius or whatever. I used to go home with him mm -hmm. and, uh, and sit by the kitchen table at night after having those southern dinners, you know, and I'd be speaking with his mother. Mm -hmm. And I just love listening to their accent. And, uh, and uh, I'd be talking to them and they'd be talking and, and uh, I didn't have an accent, of course, right. All right? But, but they had the accent. And I remember Mrs. Turner, I told her that I had a, I had a creek that runs by our house and she says, no, Doug, that wasn't a creek. It's a creek. You have a creek that runs by. You get a creek in your neck. <laughs> anyway, and Ken Turner, by the way, um, I was going to say I'm, I'm lifelong friends with him, and he uh, he stepped on a landmine, lost both his legs, one just above the knee, one below the knee, and his right arm was messed up, and so he now walks with two artificial legs, and he has a cane that he walks with, and uh, mm -hmm. has the greatest attitude you'd ever want. So, all right, uh, now. Somewhere along the line, uh, do you get uh, asked to or invited to do non-commissioned officer school, or how does that fit into the picture here? I did. When I got done with AIT at Fort McClellan, uh, they, I think they asked certain people if they would like to go to NCO school at mm -hmm. Fort Benning, Georgia. And so um, I volunteered to do that. I don't think it was a mandatory thing. I think they asked if we'd like to go. Mm -hmm. and so that was a 12-week course, and I went there. Okay. Uh, was this just part of the plan that you had, just to do what they ask you to do? No, I didn't really have a plan. And uh, I think, well, I, I thought I'd stay in the States a while longer anyway. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know about this Vietnam thing, if this was going to happen and how long it was going to go on. No one knew. So I thought, mm -hmm. I, here's my chance to stay in the States a while. Yeah. Now, were you getting trained either in AIT or uh, at NCO school by people who'd been in Vietnam? Yes. Most of the time, the people that were doing the training had been to Vietnam. Yeah. Uh, to what extent did they try to explain to you what it was like or what to do? Did they share much of that with you? They did, but then they told us um, that every area is a little bit different. It depends on what unit you get attached to. Um, they do things differently. Mm -hmm. You know, not every place does the same thing the same way. So, but, but our training really was good training. I, I felt it really was. Okay. Now, what did the... Uh, NCO school training consist of? Um, from what I remember, um, you learned all the different positions in your squad and uh, basically you, you, taught, you were taught how to, um, how to be a leader and how to motivate those people. Uh, you had two fire teams, an Alpha fire team and a Bravo fire team and, and, uh, and, and the main thing that I remember, now this is 42 years ago, mm -hmm. 43 years ago, what I remember is when we got in a firefight, the main thing we wanted to do was establish firepower superiority, okay? And so when you get shot at, the first thing you want to do is fire back, and so you can get them pinned down so they can't see where you're at. And, and, uh, but, but the training, you know, they trained us on many different weapons, mm -hmm. and they taught us how to clean them. Uh, you know, all, all the basics, they taught us how to call in artillery or mortars, mm -hmm. that type of thing. Um, how to read a compass, um, how to get from point A to point B. Now, did they do things like uh, take you out in the middle of the woods and leave you there and have you try to come back? Or Well, something similar. When I was in NCO school, we went to um, uh, Okefenokee Swamp on the north side of uh, Florida, mm -hmm. okay? And uh, we did a compass course there. Now, I remember going through the compass course um, and there were water moccasins. Now, we were just, we had M 14s, I think, at the time, maybe M16s, but we had blanks. Mm -hmm. And uh, water moccasin would be laying on a log as you went through, and we could take the rifle and put it up next to them and pull the trigger, and just the concussion would kill the water moccasin. Well, this was great in the daytime as we went from point A to point B. Well, then we had chow, uh, and, and we simulated being in Vietnam, so you're five meters apart going through mm -hmm. the chow line at night. Now, when it gets dark, we go back through the Okefenokee to go back to where we started from. Now we're doing that at night. And uh, just, uh, just the, the thinking of those water moccasins were there before now, and now we're going back in the dark, you know what I mean? Not good. Now, but they, everybody made it. And okay. Did they have alligators too? I don't think so. I don't remember seeing those. All right. Yeah. Uh, but you see, you've got, okay, so you've got some of that kind of thing. So they're trying to use the swamp as sort of an equivalent of Vietnam or as mm -hmm. close as they're going to get for, yep. for where they are. All right. Uh, now, did you do any other kind of training before they, or what else did you do before you got to Vietnam? I went airborne. Uh, okay. When I got out of NCO school, uh, they had stopped making the bombing runs to the north. Mm -hmm. 
And because of that, I had my buddy from Grand Rapids, Ken Tepper, and I decided to go airborne, uh, thinking that if we stayed in the States for another month, this whole thing might be over with. Mm -hmm. um, well, going airborne uh, was actually tough on us. They called us instant NCOs because in 12 weeks at NCO school, we became a buck sergeant, mm -hmm. E5. And there were other guys that were cadre in, in airborne that uh, had been in for 10 or 15 years to make a buck sergeant E5. Mm -hmm. And so what I remember about airborne is they made it tough on us. And I remember one guy said to me, Sergeant Buchanan, do you think I'm prejudiced against instant NCOs? And I said, yes, Sergeant. He says, drop down and give me 20. So I gave him 20 push-ups, asked permission to get up. He says, do you still think I'm prejudiced against instant NCOs? I said, yes, Sergeant. And I did that about four times like a dummy because I couldn't do any more push-ups. Mm -hmm. And anyway, uh, I just know you're not prejudiced anymore. All right, on your feet. You know, one mm -hmm. of those kind of deals. Um, but anyway, we went airborne. And, and then uh, I only made five jumps. Uh, and when I got over to Nam, I got attached to a leg unit. Now, mm -hmm. my buddy ended up going to 101st Airborne, but I ended up going to a leg unit. And they thought I was kind of special because I had the wings on my chest, you mm -hmm. know, or the, the parachute or whatever. But they found out I'm the same as everybody else. Same. All right. Uh, now, how long does airborne school last? It's actually three weeks, jump I school, believe. Jump school, yeah, okay, yep. three weeks. So you tacked on a few more weeks. Yep. Now, do they do anything else to prepare you before they actually send you to Vietnam? Because what other assignment do you have? Well, after airborne, um, I went back to my AIT unit, this time as a drill sergeant, mm -hmm. for, for one session, one eight- or nine-week session. Mm -hmm. And then after that, I had a 30-day leave, and then I went to Nam. Okay. What, but, was the, what was the purpose of having you go back and be a drill sergeant before they send you over? I think just gaining that experience as being a leader, a, a real leader now. And, uh, you know, I was a squad leader before, but now I actually had a platoon uh, that was going through the same thing I went through three or four months earlier, you know. Mm -hmm. Okay, so just a little bit more experience giving sure. orders and yep. all of this kind yep. of thing going on. All right. Uh, now, how did they get you over to Vietnam? We flew over on a commercial plane, um, and I sat with Ken Tepper, and we, uh, we had cassette recorders at the time. We'd listen to music and whatever on the way over there, and I still remember landing in Benoit, um, and when we landed, before that, I got a backup. Um, we refueled in Anchorage, and then we refueled in Yokata, Japan, and I've seen most of the movies about Vietnam, and one of the earlier ones actually portrayed, each movie I could get something out of it mm -hmm. that I could really relate to, and one of the earlier movies, I don't remember the name of it now, um, it showed a place like Yokata, Japan, and uh, we were getting refueled, so we got off the plane, and I looked across the fence, and there were guys that were going home. We were on our way to Nam, and I looked at those guys, and thought, they look a lot older than us. We were 19, 20, 21-year-old mm -hmm. kids. These guys looked like they were all 25, 28, whatever. And then um, six months later, I was on the other side of the fence, and I remember looking at these guys that were coming over as I'm going home, and I thought, they look like young kids. And I looked at us, and we looked like older guys. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so, they, so they, you get in to, what was the mood on the plane like? Or were you not paying attention because you were listening to music? No, um, I don't really remember what the, the mood was, but I remember that when we landed, I expected to be getting shot at. I'm going to Vietnam, and I remember we landed at, at Benoit, and it was just like landing at, at Kent County Airport uh, in Grand Rapids here. You know, it was nothing. And, um, and then we got on a bus, and we rode to Long Bend, and I'm guessing that was about 25 miles away. Um, but the unique thing about that bus was, I remember that there were, the windows were all out of the bus, and they had screens on the side where the windows were before. And I remember we asked, you know, what happened, no windows? And they said, well, yeah, um, the screens are there because, you know, uh, if they throw grenades at you or something, then they won't come through the window and it would bounce back because the, the screens are in place of the windows. Mm -hmm. So now so, you know you're in a war. Now, well, I didn't see anything yet. Yeah. But I go to Long Bend, and we were there for a period of time, I'm guessing maybe three or four days before we got assigned to a unit. Um, and I still didn't know I was in a war because um, it was very much like stateside. They had barracks there at Long Bend, mm -hmm. and we had a mess hall. And I was with Ken Tepper, and I remember yet um, 
walking back from the mess hall back to our barracks. And there were bunkers alongside the little road that we're on. And uh, all of a sudden, we're hearing this boom, 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 boom. And it's close. We both dive into that little bunker right there. And it was like a uh, uh, half pipe, like you see. Mm -hmm. And then it would go for, you know, 10, 15 yards. Then there'd be another little opening and not more half pipe and, and over the top with sandbags over it. And so we would just, we dove in that sucker. And then we heard the noise yet, boom, boom. And pretty soon somebody came by and it was really embarrassing because, uh, hey, what are you guys doing in there? Well, you know, here we're in Vietnam and the, the big explosions. And he says, hey, that's outgoing. That's artillery. It's outgoing. It's fire and support for the troops. Oh, okay. And then we climbed out and mm -hmm. with our tail between our legs went to our barracks, you know. So, and then about um, a couple weeks later, well, then from there, I went, I ended up going to the Big Red One or the 1st Infantry Division, mm -hmm. and our home base at the time was in Zeon. And so I went to Zeon. Oh, I didn't tell you on here anyway that the, the day we landed, when I got there was uh, uh, September 13 of 1968. Mm -hmm. And that's the day that General Ware got shot down up by Loch Ninh. He was the, the general, the commanding general for the 1st Infantry Division. Mm -hmm. And then anyway, I go to Zeon a couple days later, which was the, the home base for the 1st Infantry Division. Mm -hmm. And then uh, from there, I went to Quan Loi, which is up by the Cambodian border. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, that was a fire support base. And it was, it was a pretty good size base. We got to Quan Loi, and uh, at night they actually showed movies. We were in the Michelin rubber plantation, and they would spread sheets between the rubber trees, and they had a generator, and they would show movies. And we were watching a movie one night, and I can't do, I can't whistle, but anyway, all of a sudden, um, we heard the noise. And everybody, incoming! And everybody hit the bunkers there. So then I, that's when I found out the difference from when I was at Long Bend, and I just heard the boom, boom, the big concussion. When you hear that whistling noise, that's not a good sound to hear. Mm -hmm. That's when I found the difference. Found out what the difference was. Okay, well, let's uh, fill in a little bit here. First okay. of all, how do they get you from Long Bin to Zion to Quan Loi? How do you make those moves? Um, from Long Bin to Zion was on a bus. Okay. Um, and then from Zion to Quan Loi, we flew. And I remember flying and looking out the window. And Were you helicopter or airplane? Uh, this was a helicopter, okay. and uh, I remember looking out the window and thinking, uh, man, it's all jungle down there. You know, I'm looking for a town or a city or a village or anything, and all I just remember seeing trees. Mm -hmm. And we get up to Quan Loi, and we land at the base at Quan Loi. You know, I think I'm wrong. I think it was a C-130, actually. It was, it was a regular plane. It was a C-130 mm -hmm. that we flew up there in. Okay, but you had actually taken... Um to take a bus as far as uh, Zion, that means that the roads were safe enough at that point that yep. uh, they could drive back and forth and right. so forth. Because right. the impression often is that any time you try, you can't drive anywhere in Vietnam because oh, they're always yeah. blowing you up and, and, right. and this sort right. of thing. Well, not always. Not always, nope. All right. Uh, now, and even there, actually, to land the fixed-wing aircraft at a position close to the Cambodian border is also an indication that things were secure enough that, that yep. you could do that too, because right. a C-130 is pretty vulnerable to right. uh, an aircraft fire. Yep. Okay. Uh, now, you know you're going to the first division. Do you know at this point which company or platoon you're going to go to, or do they tell you after you get out to Quan Loi? I don't remember those details. I really okay. don't know. But I know when I got there uh, at Quan Loi, we actually trained there some more training, okay. and uh, and at night we had to pull guard duty. For the, for the big base at Quan Loi. Okay. So at this point, you're still basically replacements. You haven't Correct. gone anywhere else Correct. yet. Uh, what did they try to train you once you got, and, and once you got there? Uh, just more of the same thing and get us uh, actually, you know, with, with the temperature and humidity and all that type of thing, I mm -hmm. think, uh, was the big thing. Okay. Uh, get us did, acclimated to yeah. the, weather, the weather change and whatever. Mm -hmm. Did they tr try to give you any tips in terms of how the Vietnamese behaved or what things to watch out for? Or? Does that get left till you join the unit? Um, no, I think, I, I don't know if they did anymore. I really don't know, but, but you know, they taught us about that earlier. Uh, back when stateside, they told, told us things like, you know, don't follow trails, uh, watch out for um, booby traps, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And they might have done a little bit more of that. I really don't recall. Okay. Now, the area you were in, was, was there a civilian population around anywhere? There was. There was. And a lot of times when we went on a search and destroy mission, if we saw civilians, 
we had to stop and ask them for ID, okay, and they, they would produce their green card, you know, mm -hmm. or whatever. Okay. Did you have a Vietnamese interpreter or anything like that along with you? We did not. Okay. No, most of the time we did not. We might have once in a while, you know, in a company size operation or mm -hmm. something, but most of the time we did not. It's kind of on your own. All right. Uh, describe a little bit the physical layout of the area that you were operating in then. Uh, what kind of country was it like? Well, uh, the, the, ba the base at Quan Loi um, was actually right in the Michelin rubber plantation, okay? Um, now, there was a part of it that was cleared out for the runway, but other than that, we were in the Michelin rubber plantation. And there was part of that that was just outside of the rubber plantation where they had sprayed the Agent Orange mm -hmm. a year or two before and all the foliage was down, okay? And so uh, you could see quite a ways, like, like past the airstrip, you know, you could see a long ways. All right. Now, was the base that you were at, was this a battalion-sized base or bigger than that? Or I'm thinking it was battalion-sized. Yeah, I really don't remember. Okay. I don't know how big it was exactly. All right. Now, once you get there and you get your last bit of training, what specific unit do they assign you to? I went to uh, Company A, 1st Battalion, 28th Infantry, in the 1st Infantry Division. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, and were you simply put in as a, a squad leader or platoon sergeant or what were you? I was a squad leader. Yep. Okay. I first got put in as a squad leader. Okay. And how many men do you think were in the squad that they assigned you to? Well, a squad is supposed to be in training. A squad is 10 people. But mm -hmm. uh, over there, because uh, uh, you might have someone on R&R &R and someone has malaria and someone else might have been wounded, you probably end up a squad size, average squad size for our unit anyway, was probably seven or eight people. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, and do you remember anything about the guys who were in the squad when you joined it? Yes. Uh, well, I shouldn't say that. Not my particular squad. Um, yeah, I remember a couple of them. Mm -hmm. But, uh, no, I, I, I remember more I got, after I got hit the first time and I went back to my unit, I remember the guys I was with the, the second time mm -hmm. more so than the first group. Okay. But the first group, um, I got to throw in Patrick Dugan was a guy that uh, he was he was my point man and we walked into a u-shaped ambush and and he was killed mm -hmm. so okay now uh, when you got there uh, was the were you replacing someone who was rotating out or had he been wounded or no, killed he had been killed I, I was a replacement for someone that got killed up by Loch Ninn mm -hmm. uh, General Ware's helicopter was shot down uh, and it was actually identified by uh, my platoon anyway um, up by Loch Ninn, but I was still at Quan Loy at the time. I was not there, but, mm -hmm. but when they came back, uh, these guys were, were talking to us new recruits, and their eyes were real big, and they said there was a gook behind every tree. You know, a gook mm -hmm. uh, was a term they used to describe the Vietnamese. Mm -hmm. and, and, um, but anyway, um, yeah. They came back and, and they were all, but one of the guys was killed and that's, I was his replacement. And one of the squad leaders was killed mm -hmm. in Loch Ninn and then I was a replacement for him. All right, now when you walk in, you've got to sort of take over the squad and, and be the leader. How did you go about doing that? Don't remember exactly how I went, went about doing that, but I think I just uh, tried to befriend everybody in the squad and I asked them, you know, uh, their advice. Mm -hmm. uh, I was the rookie in the group. You know, I might have been their leader, but I was still the group. Mm -hmm. I was still the rookie, um, and, and because we had a, we had a patch that every, you know that the leaders had to follow me deal. Mm -hmm. That was a big thing, NCO school and whatever. But uh, I still acted like you know I might have been through the training, but you guys know the, the real thing. You know what I mean? You've been through it. I haven't. So. Mm -hmm. And was that the right approach to take, as far as you can tell? I think so. Yeah. Okay. Now, uh, how soon was it before you went out in the field with these guys? Oh, within a couple of days. After they came back, they might have stayed in, con in, in that fire support base. Mm -hmm. They might have been there for a night or two, pulling guard duty around the perimeter, and then, then we went out. Okay. And do you remember going out with them for the first time? Or do you have just more general memories I, of I that don't. group? I don't. I have memories of the first time that we um, pulled an insertion into a hot LZ. Okay but I don't remember the first time going out with them. No, I don't. Okay. Uh, what kind of uh, operations were, were you conducting in that area? Were you going out as platoons or company or? Well, we did 
we did a various, you know, sometimes it was squad, sometimes platoon, sometimes company. Uh, a lot of our things were, were platoon size. Uh, we'd go out into an area and then we did what we called clover leafs, where a squad would go out in one direction, each squad would take a direction, you go out and you go out maybe 100 meters or mm -hmm. roughly and just a clover leaf and come back in, a search and destroy thing. Okay. Now what kind of enemy were out there? Were they North Vietnamese so regulars by this time? We or? had BC, we, we came in contact with VC, and we also had contact with NBA. All right. Now, did they have in this area, did they have tunnels or spider holes or things like that, or not so much? Not so much there, no. Um, right. uh, how much enemy activity was there at that time? Well, you know, the movies portray that you're getting shot at all the time. Uh, where I was in the time I was there, we might go for two weeks without having any contact at all, mm -hmm. okay? And you're just out there beating the bush. and, and go from point A to point B. You might do eight to 10 clicks a day, okay? Um, through, the, through the thick stuff, no contact, but then all of a sudden you could hit it and you might have it, you know, two days in a row or something. But, but you could go two weeks, three weeks without making any contact at all. Mm -hmm. So with the, I take it then there weren't really substantial bunker complexes or things like that in that area that you were running into? Most of the time, no, mm -hmm. yes. But, but we did hit some bunker complexes, uh, like we were talking earlier, um, Hobo Woods, mm -hmm. Iron Triangle, they had, they had bunker complexes there. Okay. Now was that uh, during, was that after you got hit the first time that you go into those areas or were you starting to go there already? Uh, we went there before I got hit the first time, yes. Okay. Uh, now at, you mentioned you remembered going into your first hot LZ, can you talk about that? Um, yeah, I remember I wasn't in the first wave of choppers that came in. The first wave of choppers, they had five choppers that came in like so, mm -hmm. and they would land, and then they would call back to the, the next one's landing. They all went out the outside door and set up a perimeter, and the next group of choppers came in five in a row, and then we all got out either on the left side or everybody got out on the right side. Uh, and I was in the second wave or the third wave of choppers coming in. Uh, so we knew it was a hot LZ before we got there, and it was basically, uh, we, we hopped out into a rice paddy. And I remember um, getting stuck in the rice paddy and trying to get out. And uh, Rollins going right around, right around your head. You could hear him whistling by, you know. And, uh, and just trying to get over to the, the berm to get some cover behind you. So Were your feet getting stuck in the yes, mud? Or yes, yeah. they were. Yep. Okay. And, 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 what, trying, and trying to keep your rifle so it wouldn't get wet and you're trying to pick up and you know how that goes when you're like in mud or muck or whatever and one foot goes down, yeah, you can't make much progress. Okay, now were the other guys stuck too or did they know how to move? Some were, some were, some were moving but there was a group that was there ahead of us mm -hmm. that were actually firing support out, you know. Uh, so we were inside that perimeter mm -hmm. but, but rounds were still flying around and you didn't know where they were coming from and you could hear him whistling, you know. It reminded me of uh, uh, infiltration courses that we went through back in training mm -hmm. at night when you had to crawl under the bob wire and they were firing rounds above your head. Okay, uh, so you basically just keep slogging until you get out of that and? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah you find a way to do it. You, you know, when, when your life's on the line, you can do things and, but I still remember hearing the rounds whistling above your head as we went to the, mm -hmm. the berm. Okay, now once you got up to the berm, then do you try to get your squad together and do something with them or? I think so, but it's been a long time. I, I don't remember. I think we all went to the certain area, you know, mm -hmm. our squad did. I don't remember the, the specifics. I really don't. Okay. And with the squad, do you have an RTO with you? Do you have a radio? We don't, but I was, I was trained in how to call in artillery okay. or mortars or whatever. So. All right. Because sometimes a squad will, each squad will have its own radio and sometimes not. And so we had a radio. Okay. We had a radio, but as far as, uh, uh, oh, okay. Uh, I was thinking a forward observer, but yeah, radio yeah. tell. Yeah, we had a radio in our squad, right? All right. Uh, now, once you had landed and, and deployed, I mean, did you then start trying to take the fight to the enemy, or you just stay where you were? Or you have any sense of what happened after that? I really don't. I know that we called in. Uh, we got behind the berm and we fired, fired back, tried to keep keep them pinned down, and it was only actually a few snipers that were firing at us. Mm -hmm. uh, but then they called in. Mortars yep. and artillery yep. and that kind of thing. Call in the, the firepower and yep. 
Yep. That kind of mo moves them off. All right. Uh, now, is this kind of thing something that you get used to? Uh, um, or learn I did. To deal with? I did. Um, before I went, I used to pheasant hunt. And I uh, hate to relate it to that, but that's actually how I felt after a while when you, you know, um, I, I'd shoot back, mm -hmm. you know, establish that firepower superiority. And it really, at first, it bothered me shooting at a human being, but, mm -hmm. but after a period of time, um, it didn't bother me. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I got back to my unit after I got injured the first time, it was the first time that I was really scared. Um, it was at night, and, um, and we heard mortars coming out of a tube going at the 11th Armored Cav that we worked with also. And the 11th Armored Cav, I shot an azimuth from our location. We were, it was at night, we were on an ambush site. And uh, I shot an azimuth, azimuth from our location to where the mortar tubes were, and they did the same thing. And then uh, where that point crossed, that's where we called in the mortars and artillery and all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. And uh, anyway, then they started coming down the trail that we were ambushing at, at night. And, uh, but they actually, they knew where the trail was, and so they were firing RPGs and mortars to clear their way as they went. Mm -hmm. And uh, my radio man said, Sarge, the horn is for you. And this is in the dark now, and I remember reaching out for the horn then, and my hand was just a shaking. And that's when I was really scared. Okay. This and is my first contact after I got back to my unit now. Okay. Now, let's sort of back up again to your first time, your, your, that first time you're with the squad and you're the squad leader there for a while. Uh, can you, let's see, was, was there anything else that kind of stands out in your memory about that part of your tour before you got wounded or is the time when you get wounded kind of the next thing that kind of sticks with you? Um, well, what I remember, before I got wounded the first time, um, I remember working with the 11th Armored Cab, and I thought that was pretty neat because we got to ride on top of the tracks. You know, mm -hmm. we didn't ride inside them. Uh, civilians would call that a tank, but it's an armored personnel carrier, an APC. Kind of a big metal box on tracks. Basically, yep, yep. And we rode on top in case they hit a landmine, then mm -hmm. you'd get thrown off of your inside, then you get messed up pretty bad. So we used to ride on top. And uh, I remember working with the 11th Armored Cab, and uh, and that, that was pretty neat stuff because we didn't have to, we weren't ground pounders at the time. We weren't grunts, you know, mm -hmm. we get the ride, so. All right. Uh, now, while you were with the, the armored cav, did any of, of the tracks get, get hit or knocked out with RPGs or things like that? Um, not that I recall. Mm -hmm. But what I do recall is um, they had a flamethrower. And uh, we, they were taking us out to an ambush one night. And uh, we're riding on the tracks. And we went through a village, and it only had, it was just grass huts, you know, and there might have been three or four on one side and three or four on the other side. We went right between them on a little trail, and, um, and we got shot at from one of, the, one of the hooches anyway. And they turned and fired, and then I remember they called what they called Zippo. They got Zippo up there, the flamethrower, and that Zippo just fired at where the firepower was coming from, and that whole grass hooch just just went up in flames. And people came out running and, and they just mowed them down, you know? Mm -hmm. Because those were the guys that were firing at us, mm -hmm. so. Yeah, and you couldn't tell who was dangerous and who wasn't at you, that You really didn't know, no. Okay. Uh, now, uh, you mentioned a little bit about the getting wounded the first time. Was that you, basically, was that an ambush where they got you, or? Um, yeah, the first time, um, we were on an ambush at night, and um, and back to the other one when, mm -hmm. when they're shooting the mortars out of the tube. Yeah. This is this is another time, mm -hmm. but they were shooting the mortars out of the tube, and uh, we did the same thing that I told you before. Mm -hmm. We shot an azimuth, and and they started coming down this trail, and we we were actually supposed to, supposed to go to a different ambush site, but it got late at night, and uh, and our, our platoon leader said. He called back and asked permission to set up on a specific trail that wasn't on the map even. Mm -hmm. And he said, it's getting dark, and I want to set up here. It's a good, well-defined trail, but it's not on the map. And, uh, and it's getting too dark to, con to continue on, so mm -hmm. I'd like to set up an ambush here. And so Bill Cowan was our platoon leader at the time. We set up on that trail. We set out claymores at each end of the trail. 
Um, and we had security. We had M60s at each end also. Um, and we were there, uh, actually, what did I say, 42, 42 years ago today, mm -hmm. um, December 16, or yeah, November 16. And uh, this is 68. And, um, and they came down, after, after we called in mortars and artillery on them, they came down this trail. And I can remember seeing a red lens. This is 3 o'clock in the morning. I saw a red lens flashlight, um, and he came up to down the trail. And this is in some thick stuff, but, but it was pretty much a straight line on the trail at this point. And we weren't right on the trail. We were on the side of the trail. But I saw a red lens flashlight come down, and all of a sudden the light went off. The red lens flashlight went off. And the next thing I saw was a muzzle flash. And this guy had an AK-47, and he 30-round clip, and he sprayed the area. We only had, our platoon size operation had like 17 or 18 guys there at the time. Mm -hmm. He killed two and he wounded eight with those 30 rounds. And I was one that was wounded. And, and when I got wounded, uh, a lot of people always ask me, you know, how does it feel to get shot? Well, when I got shot, the round went through the top of my boot and into my ankle and I had hairline fracture of the fibula. And they said that the reason that round didn't go all the way through me was it probably went through somebody else first or hit something else first. It didn't have the full charge mm -hmm. or from the monsoon, the powder might have been damp or wet or something. But anyway, mm -hmm. it went through my boot and it lodged up against my fibula. Um, and then because it was night and we didn't know how many there were, um, we went and patched everybody up that was injured. Um, Jim Young was killed that night. He was the machine gunner at the one end of the trail where, where the Claymore was. Mm -hmm. And I remember um, seeing the light go off, and I thought, blow the Claymore now. I was talking to myself, blow it, blow it now. Mm -hmm. And it's a good thing we didn't because uh, we, were, we were heavily outnumbered. I think there were over 100 of them that went by us on both sides. Mm -hmm. uh, but then what we tried to do was the wounded, we tried to keep the wounded uh, quiet so they didn't know exactly where we were at. At night, you don't want to fire because then you're giving away your position. If you do mm -hmm. anything, you fire your, your claymores, you detonate your claymores, or you throw grenades, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but we patched the wounded up as best we could, and we tried to tell them, um, you're okay, you'll be okay, just be quiet, mm -hmm. keep it down, you know, because the enemy's going by us, and they were only 10 yards away in the jungle. You could hear them going by, okay? And, and they didn't know how many we were, and we didn't know how many they were. Mm -hmm. And after they were all the way past us, then we called in. We had what's called DEFCONs, defensive concentrations. Mm -hmm. And we called them in at different areas. And we had DEFCON number two, I think, was the one at, at the, the south end of that trail. Mm -hmm. And once they all were passed, we called in DEFCON number two, and we walked it away. So, mm -hmm. um, But anyway, when I was hit, I was hit in the ankle. And uh, I, I was awarded the silver star that you saw. Mm -hmm. um, but it says something that's incorrect in there. It said something about ignoring his own painful injury. Mm -hmm. My injury was not that painful. It hit a nerve, okay? Mm -hmm. And so consequently, uh, it felt like, uh, you know how when you, your foot goes to sleep mm -hmm. and you start walking on it? That's how, that's how it felt to me because that nerve was hit. And so it wasn't painful. Uh, I was walking around and mm -hmm. I was patching people up and, and they told me Jim Young was hit and he was from Cincinnati, Ohio. And he was at the other end, and I went there to check on him, and he just had one bullet hole, and, and he, he went fast anyway. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. yeah. So that particular action was not really much of a firefight, per se. It was not. Kind of, it was not. He just kind of sprays his magazine, and did you guys shoot back at we him? We did not. We don't want to give away our position. Okay. We didn't blow a claymore. We didn't do a thing. So you maintained good discipline in that situation. You knew we there did. were too many. And it's a good thing we did because we didn't know. You know, it's mm -hmm. dark. You don't know how many you're up against. And yeah. so we just let them go by us on both sides. And I think one of the ammo bearers, Jim, Jim Young's ammo bearers, counted like 150. Mm -hmm. All right. We had 17 or 18, so yeah. we were heavily outnumbered. And it's a good thing we didn't give away our position because it might not have been a good situation. Mm -hmm. So then they walked by, and uh, then we called the 11th Armored Cab out, and they came out, and they picked us up. And um, we put the bodies inside the tracks, and we hopped on and rode back. And then when we got back to their, their support base where they were before, then, then they, they ordered the dust off. So mm -hmm. that's when I got out of the field that time. Okay. So they're giving you a silver star for this in part because you kind of kept your cool and kept doing what you were supposed to be doing. I guess. Yeah. But that's the kind of thing where an officer 
writes it to the platoon leader, writes it up, or do you not know? I don't know who writes that up, but, it, but it, it's written up like, like, you know, like I won the war by myself mm -hmm. or something. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and it wasn't that way. It really wasn't. Yeah. I directed fire. I know I called in artillery. Mm -hmm. um, after they went, I called in our DEF CON, and then I walked it away from us. Mm -hmm. And then I guess the next day, I got medevaced out, but I guess they went back, and the body count was the big thing. Mm -hmm. and so they went back, and they're trying to get a body count, and we had um, company commander and battalion commanders at the time that, you know, um, I have heard that we're using the taxpayers' dollars, and so we have to have a body count. For, you know, and mm -hmm. if you see heel marks, um, how do you know if they're dead or not? You know what I mean? Yeah. And I have a brother who's a big white hunter right now, and it's deer hunting time here in Michigan. Mm -hmm. My brother counts deer like crazy, but I went out with him, and, and, and he's pretty realistic about this because we saw deer, deer come out of the woods one night mm -hmm. at dusk, and then they went back in the woods, and then, and let's say we saw six the first time, and now they went back in the woods, and now all of a sudden you see three more. Now, are those the same three, mm -hmm. or are those three different deer? You know what I'm saying? And it was the same thing with, when you see heel marks, how do you know if, you, you get my point. Yeah, but I guess the idea would be if they went back and if they go to the area that's hit by the artillery, um, if they find bodies or oh, sure. parts of it, sure. like they, sure. they, they do, can do some calculation sure. that way too. But basically, probably the, the fire was successful at doing what it had to do. Yep. All right, now you've gotten hit. Now, at what point does it really register with you that, that you've been hit or you have to get out of there? Well, I knew I was hit instantly. Mm -hmm. But what I thought was, I thought I was just grazed. Mm -hmm. Okay, I didn't know there was a bullet in my leg at the time. All right, I thought I was grazed. So like I said, I was walking around. I started patching up wounded people. Mm -hmm. um, one guy I patched up, his name was Spence or Pence. Mm -hmm. um, but he had, he had, he got shot through the, through the face kind of like. Mm -hmm. And I remember finding a, a pressure point on his jawbone to stop the bleeding and, and patched him up. And then someone said someone else was hit. And so I patched him up as best I could at the time. And then someone said, I don't, Young has to check out Young. So I went down to the other end. I was at the southern end of this ambush site that we were at. And I checked out Young and I couldn't find anything. And he had one bullet hole. Mm -hmm. and, and that was it. And, uh, and I took a pulse at first on Jim Young. And uh, I think through the excitement, it was 3 o'clock in the morning, I thought I felt a pulse, a weak pulse, but, but I, it might have been my feeling my own mm -hmm. pulse. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so, uh, but he went in a hurry. It, it didn't take much. Now, at some point, did somebody take a look at you and say, um, Doug, you're hit, you have to get out of here? They did. We rode on the 11th Armored Cav, and we went back to their, their base that they were at. And when I got there, the first sergeant was there, and our first sergeant. And he says, are you hit? And I says, yeah. I said, I think I just got grazed. Well, as they took my boot off, they saw I just had one little hole there, OK? And, and it did bleed quite a bit before, but the bleeding had stopped. Mm -hmm. um, I actually could hear the blood slushing around in my boot as I was walking around patching people up and stuff. But, but you know, back then, um, it's, the bleeding must have stopped, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, so no, no arteries or whatever were hit or veins. Okay. So. Now, once they take a, take a look at that, then what do they do with he it? He said, the first sergeant looked at it, and he said, oh, you got hit. And I said, yeah, I know. And he said, no, there's, you're going back. And I said, really? Okay. So they had the dust off come in when it got light, and I got on that chopper, and I, I don't know what hospital I went to to begin with, but I stayed in the country. Most of my time was spent at Cameron Bay. Mm -hmm. as, as they got the bullet out, and then I had actually had wire stitches. I'd never seen wire stitches before, but I had wire stitches in there. And then I was Cameron Bay for roughly a month, I guess. Mm -hmm. And what do you do with your time at that point? Go down by the South China Sea. It's mm -hmm. kind of like, uh, uh, kind of like an R and R, I guess. Mm -hmm. Really, I was on crutches, but uh, and we had barracks, and it, it was a lot like the mash unit that you see on TV. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's how that's how it was at Cameron Bay. And as I looked at a map the other day before I came for this. I could see, I always heard it was out on a peninsula and it was really mm -hmm. safe because it has special forces. Mm -hmm. And the only way to get there was out on this peninsula and special forces were at the other end. So we were mm -hmm. really in a safe area. All right. Uh, now, do, do they feed you better while you're in the hospital or take care of you any better? Yeah, we had hot meals instead of sea rations. Yep. From what I can recall. Yep. And do they have... I actually had Thanksgiving dinner in Coochie. Okay. After I got hit on November 16, I got hit. And then 
I was still processing around in different places. I went to Vung Tau, was another hospital mm -hmm. I was at. Uh, but Cameron Bay, I was in Cameron Bay most of the time. But I went to Coochie, a hospital in Coochie, and I still remember having Thanksgiving dinner in Coochie. In Coochie, you were talking about tunnels. Mm -hmm. uh, I never really, that wasn't our area of operation. But when I was in the hospital there years later, that's where there were a lot of tunnels mm -hmm. under Coochie. Right. Okay. Uh, so you get, you, you have your month away from your unit, basically. Yep. Uh, and so when do you go back? I went back the first of the year in 69, January of 69. Um, mm -hmm. I got released from the hospital. And from what I remember is we found our own way. Basically, you could go to some bases and tell them you had to get to another base, and they'd put you in the back of a, a, a truck, a deuce mm -hmm. and a half. And then you'd get to the base that way. And, uh, and I got to my base, and then I heard that uh, Bob Hope show was going to be in Long Bend. And so uh, somehow I got to Long Bend uh, and saw the Bob Hope show before I got back to my unit. So I saw the Bob Hope show, and uh, my wife-to-be and whatever, they, I guess they saw me on TV on mm -hmm. the Bob Hope show standing by a telephone pole or something. <laughs> but I had just been released from the hospital, and those guys that were that hospital, they had blue gowns on mm -hmm. they were right up front i was way in the back of this thing you know. mm -hmm. but anyway i was on the way actually back to my unit again when when this all happened okay because that was like a christmas show at that point yep yep, yep. All, right. all right now was your unit still at Quan loy when you got back or had they moved no they had moved to lai k okay. so when i got back uh i, I went to lai k now that at a certain point was a divisional base or a larger base, or did it seem to you to be about the same size as Quan Loy had been? No, it was bigger. Lai okay. K was bigger than Quan Loy. Yep. Yeah. All right. Uh, and then you get back there. Do you go back to your company then, and then to the platoon, or how does it work? Yeah, I went back to my company. Yep. And then we went to the platoon. Uh, I think I didn't go to the platoon. I waited for them to come back, mm -hmm. and then the next time that we went out, I went with them. Okay. Uh, now, had the, was the, your squad, did you go back to the same squad, at least in, on paper? It was all different. It was, uh, it, maybe on paper it was, yeah, but, uh, but it was totally different people. I think there was uh, one or two guys that were the same, but basically it was all, it was all different. And over the years, you know, I've, I lost track of the names and stuff, and I, mm -hmm. I'm not real active. I didn't used to be. And there's reunions and things, mm -hmm. now I'm just getting into that recently, so. So you come back, so, so where had the guys gone? I don't know. I don't know that. I don't know where all they were before that. While I was gone, you mean? Yeah, yeah. Oh, the guys that were there before? Yeah, yeah. Oh, the guys that were there before, um, some of those, it was the end of their tour. Mm -hmm. Other guys found a job in the rear. Uh, they might, be, might have became a clerk mm -hmm. or a cook or, or something else. Or uh, I think uh, one of them might have had malaria, mm -hmm. that type of thing. Okay. So as far Some as you know, injured. Yeah. So, but it wasn't as if the squad had been wiped out someplace oh, no. or nope. anything like that. No, that did not happen. Yeah. No. Nope. And that's sort of characteristic of Vietnam. There's this constant yep. turnover yep. of personnel and right. then the line units for one reason or another. Right. So you get back and you go back in as a squad leader again. Yep. Okay. Yep. All right. Now. The group that you joined, were these mostly new guys now? Yes. Hadn't been really there? They might have been there since the first of the year, roughly. Mm -hmm. So they had yeah. been in country for a month, mm -hmm. you know. All yep. right. Uh, well, now, this was the first of the year, so they might have got there in December, December yeah. sometime. Yeah. Okay. Uh, when you joined them, did they strike you as sort of having enough experience to know what they were doing already? Or did you have to teach them anything? Or uh, They had already seen some activity they've seen some been in firefights and that type mm -hmm. of thing when i joined them already i believe and so no I, it was no problem i don't remember any any problems at all all right uh, that we didn't have before mm -hmm. um, point man was not a popular place and i remember being a squad leader i i kept track of the riflemen in my squad who walked point we took mm -hmm. turns at it um and we had some arguments about it's not my turn that kind of thing mm -hmm. so and that happened before I was wounded the first time and, and after I was wounded, so be so, both before and after, so. So it wasn't the case where you had somebody who's kind of a natural for that or just decided he'd do it all the time? Or? No, but we did have um, one guy that actually volunteered, a rifleman, because one time what happened was we walked through an ambush and they picked on the last guy, okay? And so he didn't mind volunteering to walk point, mm -hmm. okay? All right. But most of the time, there, there was, 
I shouldn't say most of the time. Some guys were really good about it, but there, there were a couple individuals that, it's not my turn, and then I would get it out and look. You know, there, that type of thing, you know. Okay. Now, were you in this, were you still on in the rubber plantation area, or were you now away from that in another country? No, we were out of that. We were out of the rubber plantation. We were south of the rubber plantation now. By K, I don't remember. Uh, there might have been a rubber plantation there also, but, but the area that we were operating in, our base camp was by rubber plantation, but I don't remember being by the rubber plantation as much after I was back there the second time. Okay. Now, were you operating in jungle or a defoliated country or farm areas? Um, all of the above. Okay. Yep. At times it was jungle. At times it was farmland, uh, rice fields and whatever. Um, yeah, at times... Uh, there were areas of foliage that, that had sprayed the aging orange, and, and it was all, the foliage was just all down for 200 yards, you know, or, or better than that, a half a mile, you know, the foliage was just down. Mm -hmm. Now, was the enemy activity level or the kind of action you were having, was it pretty much the same as before, or were there things now that were different? No, this is only, you know, a couple months from when I was there before, mm -hmm. so it, it was pretty much the same as I recall. But it wasn't, you know, the movies always portray it like you're having contact every other day or something. Like I told you earlier, we, I think our average might have been you'd go two weeks before you had contact, okay? Mm -hmm. And sometimes you'd have it two days in a row, but a lot of times you'd be just out there in the heat, beating the jungle, and, and, and then all of a sudden you might just have a, a sniper fire at you or something, you know? So. Now, was most of what was going on you guys trying to kind of push out and find the enemy, or were they sending substantial bodies of forces your no, way? No, most of it was us going towards them, yes. Mm -hmm. And now that you say that, it reminds me of in training, they always taught us um, don't walk down trails. Mm -hmm. They'll booby trap trails. They'll ambush that trail. But we got over to Nam, and when I got hit the second time, we were actually, my squad was walking point for the company, and my platoon, my platoon leader said, we're walking down that trail. And that was the command that he got from the, the company mm -hmm. commander and probably from higher up. It's all right. coming downhill. And they said, we're going to go down this trail. So. And it was booby trapped or just ambushed? No, or? but we walked into a U-shaped ambush. Yeah, so they were yeah. looking for you. Yeah. yeah, I think sometimes they talk about how well a trail is still faster and sometimes they want the speed. Uh, and that's another thing. Um, um, Patrick Dugan is a name that... Um, he was, he was the point man, walking point. And um, we were moving too fast, and we blew an ambush the night before. Mm -hmm. And we knew that they were in the area. We heard chickens, all right, roosters. We heard roosters crowing and stuff in the morning. So they were around there somewhere, and we had just moved out way too fast. And so I just went up to Dugan, and I said, between Dugan and I, he was, he's the point man, I had a compass man, and I was the third mm -hmm. guy in the file of the squad there. So I went up to him, and I said, Dugan, slow down. Slow way down, will you? And I just got back in my position, and we moved out again. And we didn't go two minutes, and uh, we walked into the shoe shape ambush. Mm -hmm. And that's when he, he was killed. Pat Dugan was killed. And again, he didn't suffer because, from what I heard later, um, he was, they had a bead on him, and, mm -hmm. and you got him right now instantly. Yeah. Now, when you were out there and you're doing these search and destroy missions, would you stay out overnight? Oh, sure. Okay. And sure. what would you do at night? Set up an ambush. Okay. Did you have occasions where you were going from one place to another or just patrolling but not ambushing? Would you set up a perimeter with a platoon or did you, were you not doing that kind of thing? Yeah, we would do that too. We would, we would hook up with a platoon or the company, mm -hmm. you know. Yep. Now, there were times that we would go back to a big fire support base, but a lot of times we stayed out there. Uh, and they also tried to get us into a big fire support base or a big area like Benoit. We mm -hmm. would go to what's called a stand down. Mm -hmm. And I think our unit tried it, I think it was every two weeks, two to three weeks. And that way we would go there and uh, I remember going to the NCO club and it was guys that were from the Air Force at the Benoit Air Base. Mm -hmm. And we would go in the NCO club and flush the toilet and scream, you know, a flush toilet. You know what I mean? <laughs> it was pretty neat stuff. Yep. What kind of uh, interaction did you have with the Air Force guys? If you go well, that was about it. You know, we'd club. go there and have a few beers at the NCO club, and they'd take us. And I saw some of their barracks. It was like stateside. Mm -hmm. and, and some of those guys would say things like, um, what's it like out there? You know, uh, Because we've only had um, incoming rounds twice in the last year here in this mm -hmm. big 
base, but, but anyway. Yeah. Uh, in general, how do you characterize the morale in, in your unit when you're with them and they're in the field and that kind of thing? Um, I think overall it was pretty good, considering um, there were times that, uh, that people had, had a tough time. You know, they'd get a Dear John letter, mm -hmm. that type of thing, or, or, or a letter talking about uh, a relative or something that passed away or, or whatever, you mm -hmm. know. Uh, and, and I think our unit, uh, 1st Infantry Division, actually, they tried their best to boost our morale. Um, after we made contact, if we blew an ambush or something, um, generally they tried to get us hot meals the next day. Mm -hmm. uh, they'd resupply us with uh, sea rations, um, get clean uniforms out to us. We got uniforms in a, in a duffel bag, you know, they'd, they'd send a bunch of pants, mm -hmm. a bunch of shirts in another duffel bag, and they might have different sizes, and then you would just throw your dirty ones in there and mm -hmm. put a clean uniform on, you know. But they really tried to get your letters, you get your mail, mm -hmm. um, that type of thing. They really, they really tried to boost our morale as much as they could. Okay. Uh, now, within uh, your platoon company squad, were there any kind of racial tensions or things like that? That's sort of another one of the Vietnam stereotypes. I don't remember any racial tensions. Did we you? did have some blacks. I had a radio man for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, I looked at my pictures the other day, actually, because I don't look at them that often. Mm -hmm. and, and I had a, a, a guy, Ward was his last name, and he was my radio man. He was black. I, mm -hmm. No, we, did, we didn't have any problems. I do remember also um, that we went along a river and uh, a creek mm -hmm. or a river. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, he couldn't swim. And this guy, I actually, I was, I'm tall, mm -hmm. and so he was a shorter feller, and I, I actually helped, helped him through the, the, the deeper water, mm -hmm. as to say, as to speak. But anyway, yeah, it, uh, okay. but we didn't have any racial problems yeah. that I recall. All right. Uh, now, did you encounter anybody who was, you know, using marijuana or drugs, either in rear areas or up forward? Yes. Um, in the, in the base camp, we got back to a base camp, we had one gentleman in our group, uh, in the first group that I was mm -hmm. in now. Uh, and this guy was actually, uh, he came back from Loch Ninh. And uh, he, he's the guy that I'm thinking, I'm talking about, he had eyes that were as big as saucers mm -hmm. when he came back, because he, he, was, he was in the thick of it up there. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyway, we worked with Cambodian mercenaries that walked point. And uh, those Cambodians, when we got back to a base camp, they had their own little tent they would go to mm -hmm. and, and I don't know what they were smoking in there but it didn't smell like um, Marlboro's mm -hmm. and, uh, and this one gentleman out of our group uh, he went with them he hung out with them and, mm -hmm. and he also got into that stuff and um, but that was on ba in the base camp that was in the base camp that's true yeah. that's in the big base camp yeah uh, would people light up in the field or oh no oh cigarettes we all yeah. smoke cigarettes mm -hmm. You know, we got cigarettes in our sea rations, all right? So almost everyone smoked, except for one guy, and I had my notes here that I haven't looked at much yet, but uh, his name was Tate, and he was the preacher man. Now, mm -hmm. a lot of guys carried a New Testament right here. Mm -hmm. But Tate, when we took a break, when we were out beating the jungle, and what was break time, we all lit up. Tate, he got out, and the preacher man, he was reading his New Testament. Mm -hmm. And I remember what I got to say about Tate was, one day, we, uh, one night we blew an ambush, and the next morning we got resupplied. Again, they're trying to boost our morale. And Tate says, uh, who's going to church? And I said, huh, you going to church with me, Sarge? I says, today Sunday? See, back then, watches just told what time it was, yeah. okay? I didn't know it was Sunday. And so I went to church with Tate. Mm -hmm. On the resupply choppers, they took us back to the base camp. We went to church. And uh, I still remember that service. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, so on the whole, we sang "Onward, Christian Soldiers," of course. <laughs> well, you know. Okay. So, uh, to, to, in terms of to looking at the morale question, then basically these guys were there and they were doing their job and they were doing it pretty well. Would you say that's fair? The soldiers in the field. Yes. Yeah, we did. We did the best uh, we had to. Mm -hmm. You know, did the best that we could do. All right. Uh, now, were there, while you're out there in the field and so forth, before you get hit the second time, were there any kind of large-scale operations you were involved in, or was it mostly just kind of platoon and company kind of operations? 
I think it was mainly, mainly platoon and company, and we had some squad size. You know, we'd go out uh, LOH choppers. Uh, I thought this was pretty cool that um, I'd get on an LOH if they wanted us to ambush a certain area at mm -hmm. night. We would actually go out and look at different areas. We knew where we were going to go, but right. to fool the enemy, we'd go here and mm -hmm. we'd go here and we'd drop off here, and, and then they didn't know where we were going to go. But I was looking at an area from the chopper that we would be ambushing that night, and then we'd go back, and then we would go out there and go in an overwatch position before you go into your ambush site. Just before dark, you go in and set up your claymores and, and whatever. Okay. Now, were you operating at times in the area they call the Iron Triangle? Yes. Okay. And was that in some way different from other places, or were there different issues there, or was it just pretty much the same? It didn't seem any different to me. Um, uh, there were people that were dug in there. Uh, there were bunkers there. But other than that, I, I don't remember anything being different. Now, did you ever have to take on the bunkers and try to attack them? No, or? I never did. Right. No, we never did. No. All right. The only thing I remember about bunkers is um, one time we came in contact with some people that were dug in, some enemy that was dug in, and, and I joke about this and say the difference between the Army and the Marine Corps is the Marine Corps, that head guy, he, when they make contact, he pulls out his forty five and says, charge! Well, the Army, we were more, uh, I, you can call it cowardly, that's okay, that wouldn't hurt my feelings. But anyway, we would, uh, we would if we, we had contact from a bunker, we would pull back, we would call in mortars, mm -hmm. artillery, we even called in napalm, mm -hmm. okay? And then we'd go check it out. That was the big difference that, that I heard anyway. I don't right. know how the Marine Corps did it, but. Did they ever do any B-52 strikes near here? They area? did, they did. And they let us know we were out in ambush at night and they let us know um, how far away it was going to be. And, and that night you'd be out there and you could actually, you could hear it, but at times you could actually feel the concussion from those mm -hmm. B-52s. And that's where we actually got a lot of our water um, from the bomb craters, okay? When the bomb crater would fill up with water, that's where we got our water. Mm -hmm. And what I remember about our water, our canteen, when you filled up your canteen, if you could see the bottom of your canteen when it was full, um, full of water, then you had to put one iodine tablet in there, okay? If you couldn't see the bottom, you had to put two iodine tablets in, all right? Now, what we used to do, there used to be a thing before your day, it was called fizzies. And my wife-to-be at the time, and my mother and other people, when they sent us letters, they would send me a six-pack or so of fizzies. And so when I got that water and put those iodine tablets in there, then I might pop a couple grape fizzies in there or, mm -hmm. or cherry fizzies or whatever to hide that iodine taste. So fizzies were... A big thing. Yeah, I guess you hear about uh, people using going through a lot of Kool-Aid that way. Kool-Aid too, probably. Yeah, I, I just remember the fizzies. Oh, you had fizzies. Yep. All right. Uh, so you've heard that before, huh? Well, about the wa the water is sort of an issue because there yeah. wasn't a way to get good fresh water in a lot of places. Right. right. And people had different approaches to it. Uh, would they bring you things like beer or pop or stuff when you were out in the field? Not out in the field, but at the fire support base they did. They actually would give you two beers, I think it was, in our unit anyway, if you, were, if you came back into a fire support base and you weren't going to be going out on guard duty that night. Yep. Mm -hmm. Then you could have a couple beers a day. Okay. You had mentioned a moment ago that there were Cambodian mercenaries with your unit. Yep. Uh, can you describe them at all, or what do you remember of, about them aside from what they smoked? Oh, well, I don't even know what they smoked, but anyway, mm -hmm. what I remember about them was um, they were Buddhist, most of them, and you don't mess with their head or you don't mess with their helmet, anything with their head or their helmet, they would come on glued because that's their religious, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, and so uh, they'd take their helmet off sometime, their steel pot, and they'd set it down, but don't touch it. That's, a, that's something that's really sacred. And, and because they're, they're shorter in stature, a lot of times, you know, people would you go up to somebody mm -hmm. and rough up their hair or something, that's a no-no. And that's basically all I remember about them. The communication was a little bit of a, a, little bit of a problem, mm -hmm. but it wasn't anything real serious, I know. Now you said they would walk point for you. Did you ever have them walk point for your squad or platoon? Or yes, they did. And I don't. I don't remember. Uh, we also walked along this river one time. Our area of operation, which was, uh, I think it was something like six or nine miles north of Benoit, and we we patrolled along a river, and we had dogs too that would work mm -hmm. with us. So. All right. Uh, let's see now. We talked a little bit before just about the civilian population. Were they, did you see people who were just like in small villages or uh, were you in some near towns sometimes that had more people in them? Or? Yeah, um, 
most of the time when we were out, we were, it's a small village is, the, is all we saw. The only time I really saw a big town was uh, when, I was, when I was going from one point to another on a bus or something mm -hmm. like that, or, or going to my R&R, &R, you'd take a bus then, you know. Okay, so did you get an R&R &R at some point before I you did. got hit? I did, I went to Manila. Okay, uh, and how did they work the R&R &R process? Do you have to apply for it, and then do you get to pick where you go, or? Well, I don't know. I don't remember that. I remember that when I came back to my unit, after being wounded the first time, I got back to the base camp, mm -hmm. and I was actually going to go back out in the field, and they had an R&R &R to the Philippines, and no one was taking it. They had, I don't know if someone got killed that was supposed to have it, or what, I don't know what happened, but they said, anybody want to go to the Philippines? And so here I am. I just, I wasn't in a hurry to get back out to the field. Mm -hmm. And so I went to the Philippines for my R&R, &R, and I don't remember, you know, three days or five days or whatever it was, but um, I had actually friends in the Philippines. Uh, from my mother sent medical supplies during the Second World War to the Philippines, mm -hmm. and um, there was a lady there. Her name was Pura Lacerna, and she was a nurse. And she married a guy, or she was a doctor actually. Mm -hmm. And she married a guy uh, who was also a doctor, and they had trouble getting medical supplies. But my mother's brother was stationed in Manila, and uh, before this lady was married, I got I got to straighten that out, I guess. Uh, but anyway, my mother supplied things, and then after the war, she came to the States. And because Douglas MacArthur was there, uh, I shall return. Mm -hmm. Hence, my name is my first name is Douglas. You know, because of all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. So, all right. But so, did you go visit these people when you went to the Philippines? I did. I did. I went there, and I met them. And um, and and they have. She has a lot of adopted kids. They didn't have any of their own kids, they, and she had an orphanage, mm -hmm. and, uh, and one of her older sons actually took me and gave me a tour of the Philippines for a couple of days. I rode around with him, and he showed me all different things, and I stayed at their house, uh, Quezon City, north of Manila. Mm -hmm. yep. So you probably got into a whole lot less trouble than you might have on your own. Uh, probably, yeah. All right. Yep. So you get to do that, but then eventually, so, and so that's right before you go back to your unit. Now. Um, can you talk then about get, getting hit the second time? Yeah, the second time was when uh, uh, Pat Dugan was walking right. point. Right. Uh, I remember that we blew an ambush the night before. Mm -hmm. And as a matter of fact, that particular, the night before, um, uh, I'm trying to think, Miller, there was a guy, he was a platoon leader by the name of Miller, who um, got the Medal of Honor posthumously. He, a grenade came in or something, he jumped on it, and that was not right by us. He was not our platoon leader, but he was a couple area, in the general vicinity right. anyway. Uh, but anyway, uh, we blew the ambush that night out in open field, and I remember uh, um, they were screaming, um, these are NVA now, and they're, and they're, they're dying out there at night, and um, you can't sleep. You know, uh, even we take turns of being on guard duty and stuff, but these guys are out there losing their life. I think that was your microphone falling off the chair. But Is that off? No, it's, it's on. It should be okay. It's okay. All right. Yeah. Um, so anyway, um, yeah, we made contact that night, blew the ambush, and then the next morning we had, uh, we had hot chow, the chow line, and they came and resupplied us. I got mail. Um, I remember reading a, a letter I got from my wife-to-be how she was in Chicago, and uh, she was a dental assistant at the time, and, and she went there on a dental convention mm -hmm. of some type, and she was having a great time, and I thought, as I read this letter, boy, what it's like to be in the world, you know, mm -hmm. because uh, it was totally different where we were. Yeah. And uh, anyway, yeah, then, uh, then we were told we were going to move out, and, uh, and our platoon is going to walk point for the company. And it was my squad's turn to walk point for the platoon. And so uh, Dugan walked point. And mm -hmm. then, like I said earlier, that we walked into that U-shaped ambush. And I just told them to slow down just before that. And then they opened up on us. And, um, and years later, uh, Pat Dugan was from Pennsylvania. Um, I don't know the name of the town north of Pittsburgh. I think mm -hmm. it's Tartinium or something like that. But I was working in the general area, and I, I called. Um, I looked in the phone book for Dugan's, and, and I called, and I actually spoke with Pat Dugan's brother. Mm -hmm. 
And he said Pat was buried just on the other side of the hill from his house. And he says, um, I told him I was the last person on this earth to talk to Pat. And I just told him, slow down, you know, and whatever. And he said, you know, my dad would like to talk to you. And so he gave me his dad's number. Mm -hmm. And so I called his dad. And I talked to his dad a little bit. And I told him the same thing. And his dad asked me, he said, can you tell me something? And I said, I'll try. He says, was anybody else killed that day? And I said, sir, I really don't know because I was injured and I was medevaced out of there right after that. Mm -hmm. So to my knowledge, when we walked into the ambush, he was the only, only one that was killed. Mm -hmm. And he said, thank you. And he hung up. So. All right. Now, what were you hit with? I really don't know. Okay. Um, my, area, my area to uh, cover was, at the time, Dugan was the point man. And then I had a compass man, I don't remember his name, but he was left-handed. Mm -hmm. So Dugan would fire to the left front. That was his area to cover. The compass man, being left-handed, he covered to the right front. Mm -hmm. And then I was also on the left, was my area to cover. And so when we walked in the U-shaped ambush and they blew the ambush, I hit the deck and my first 20-round clip on the M16, mm -hmm. I fired that and sprayed that to the front. Now I'm laying on my belly, and when I rolled over like this to get my next magazine out of my ammo pouch, I rolled over and about oh, 10 feet away, as I'm laying on my belly, I just saw an explosion. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what it was, if it was a hand grenade or a claymore, I don't really yeah. know what it was, okay. but I felt the back of my leg. Uh, I felt something hit the back of my leg, didn't know what it was, and uh, I was wounded, shrapnel went through the back of my leg, behind my knee. And, uh, and then I looked back at my radio man who was right behind me, and he, he only had like six days left in country he was what they called short yeah. and he was pushing the ground like that going backwards and i crawled up and caught up with him and, and he he handed me the the horn and he says um, well i said give me the horn and i the company commander was back there calling and mm -hmm. he says uh, he says, what do we got up there and i said well you know we walked into a u-shaped ambush in probably eight or ten positions and uh he says everybody okay and i says no i said i'm hit and i don't know about the guys ahead of me you know, he says, well, he says, if I call in artillery, can you adjust fire? And I said, roger that. Mm -hmm. So he called in the artillery, and then I adjusted it. And, I, and he said, then we're going to pull back. And so I called up to the two guys ahead of me, and I told them, I said, I don't know how you guys are doing, but we're pulling back. And this is in the midst of everybody, all the firing going mm -hmm. on. And at this firefight, this reminded me of a movie also. Um, and I, oh, Saving Private Ryan. There's a scene in there where it shows a firefight, and it's just mass confusion. Mm -hmm. Now, you've got to imagine this firefight, we've got eight or ten positions in a U-shape. We walked in. I'm the third guy in the file. I got a company of guys behind me mm -hmm. when this happened. So they're all firing this way. Now, the U-shape ambush, mm -hmm. they're all firing this way. And all of us, you, you know, so it's just... You're right in the middle. You're in the middle. You really are. And it's... it's, it's that's that one scene that Saving Private Ryan, I could really relate to that. Um, but anyway, where was I? Well, <laughs> you basically, you had, at that point, you were, you were calling in fire. Oh, I called in, the, and I hollered up to those two guys, and I said, we're pulling back. Mm -hmm. I said, if you can come, come with us. If you can't, just lay there and play dead, and we'll come to get you as soon as we can. But we're pulling back. Mm -hmm. And so we pulled back, and they, were, they both stayed up there. I guess the compass man actually had a round that went through his... I think this was a humorous. Th uh, through the top of the femur. Femur. Yeah. Okay. The thigh femur. Thigh okay. Bone, yep, yeah. yep, yep. Anyway, he had, one, he had a round that went through there. Um, and then there was a guy that actually helped me and, and pulled me back. Mm -hmm. And his name is Dan Boylan from Monroe, Michigan. And I guess Dan told me this later at, at one of the reunions. Mm -hmm. But um, Dan said when we pulled back, he helped me to get to the medevac chopper. And then the first sergeant saw him, and he said he was covered in blood. Mm -hmm. And the first sergeant said, Dan, you better get on there too. Why? And it was all of my blood. But back in those days, there was no, mm -hmm. this is the 60s now, you know. Yeah. There was no such thing as HIV or anything. And so Dan was mm -hmm. covered in my blood, I guess. That's what Dan told me. And also, um, Jesse Lockhart was our platoon leader at the time. And Jesse just told me just a few months ago at a reunion in Virginia, that he said that uh, he was asked to put these choppers in for the medevac that came for the medevac. He was asked to put them in for some kind of award because they came in under fire. Mm -hmm. And Jesse says, no way was I going to do that. He says, you know that when you guys got medevac out of there, they got sh you got shot at? 
I'm, I says, no, mm -hmm. I don't remember any of that. I don't know if I was out or conscious or whatever. But, but he said, oh, yeah. He says, when they came in, when I called it in, I told them to come in from the north because the enemy was in the south. Okay. Mm -hmm. He said, what do they do? They come right over the enemy and they got shot at on the way in. And she says, when they were there, he says, I told them again, take off, go out north. Don't mm -hmm. go that way. They took off and turned around and went right back over it again. He says, no way am I putting him in for some <laughs> kind of an award. He says, they didn't go the way I told them to come in, you know? So, anyway. All right. A uh, couple other things that we talked about uh, before coming into the interview session that, that we haven't made it in here. Um, one of them, uh, you made it into the newspapers a few times while you were in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think the first time you got wounded, that showed up, so people are seeing that in the papers at home? Yeah, uh, I guess so. Okay. Well, I don't know, how much communication did you have with people back home? I remember doing letter writing stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, I did that, and I remember uh, there's actually a picture of me sitting uh, in a tent somewhere mm -hmm. and, and writing a letter in, in my pictures, which I don't have very many of. Mm -hmm. um, I also remember they had some telephone that we could go to and... and Somehow it was dispatched through, but you know, over there there's a 12 hour difference. So, right now, mm -hmm. if it's 4 30 here, it's 4 30 in the morning over mm -hmm. there, okay? So, uh, so it was hard trying to connect that way, also. But, but I do remember a couple times that I would call, mm -hmm. and I don't know if that was through a ham radio deal or what, mm -hmm. I don't, really don't remember how exactly it worked, but I do remember calling home a couple would times. Would that be when you were back at a base camp or yes. Cameron yes. or someplace? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Uh, and then you managed to lose your first Purple Heart? Yeah, um, I had forgotten that. Um, but I had uh, a rucksack with, with some of my personal things in it. One was the Purple Heart, and one was a bullet that they took out of my leg. Um, and that was kind of a cool thing. I guess I was going to have that made into a necklace, mm -hmm. right, with a bullet that came out of my ankle. And I had that in a pill bottle in my rucksack, and we were out in ambush. And basically, the rucksack was hanging up on what they call engineering stakes, where they mm -hmm. put engineering stakes up, made like a tent frame. It was hanging up there. But uh, the base kind of got overran. I don't know if it totally overran. I don't remember. But I know that uh, my rucksack with a white phosphorus grenade in there, uh, it burned up. And so when I got back there a few days later, I was looking for, for that bullet mainly. Mm -hmm. I wasn't so concerned about the Purple Heart, but the bullet. Um, I was looking for that. I remember going through the ashes, and I never found it. Never found anything, actually. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, now, are there um, other particular events or, or things that kind of stand out in your memory about the time in Vietnam before you um, got medevaced out the second time? Are there other kinds of things that you want to get in the story here? Uh, no, not really that I can recall. I remember... Um, when I got hit the second time, I was in country, and uh, they knocked me out, and they were going to sew it up. The back of my leg, I had, I had a hole in the back of my right knee, basically. And um, I came to, and I felt the same. And the doctor, or the people in charge, nurses, whatever, they said, um, we couldn't stretch the skin. The doctor told me, I couldn't stretch the skin far enough. Mm -hmm. He said, we have to send you to Japan for a skin graft. And so, uh, consequently, I had to leave Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And I went to Japan, and my hair was bleached out. And here comes the doctor in Japan, and he was from California, and he had bleached mm -hmm. out blonde hair. And he says, um, yep, he looked at it, and he says, I'll sew you up tomorrow. And I said, well, they already tried to sew me up in Nam, and they couldn't stretch the skin far enough. And so, I'm actually here for a skin graft. And he says, well, look, he says, maybe you don't understand. He says, but I'm the boss here. And I said, I'll sew you up tomorrow. I'll sew you up tomorrow. Okay. Mm -hmm. So he did. He sewed it up. But then what he did is he had to stretch the skin. And when they did that, my, my leg ended up being bent at about a 90-degree angle. And they had stitches in the back to close that hole in the back okay. of my knee. And then it was actually a half cast. They had a cast on the back half. And it was a two-piece cast. And then they had, like, hand wheels on the side. And then each day they'd open it up another 10 degrees or so until it finally got to 180 degrees. But that pulled all that tissue back there. But, you know, at the time they were doing the best they could with the knowledge they had, I guess. Mm -hmm. And then, anyway, after the cast was finally taken off, that after a period of time my leg kind of would not go straight because this was all pulled back here. Mm -hmm. And so I, I walked with a, uh, a little limp for a while. But 
Now, did eventually it just straighten itself it did. out? It did. Yep. Okay. I remember doing therapy with sandbags and, and whatever, and it finally straightened out. So how long did you stay in Japan? Oh, I don't think I was there, but a week or so. Okay. And then I came back to um, St. Louis, Missouri. Mm -hmm. Missouri. I, um, I came into St. Louis, and, and that's a story that I have written down, and I was going to try and type it out and bring mm -hmm. it, and I, I didn't. But I can tell you basically what it, what it says. I was on a Metadac plane from Japan. And, uh, and like I said earlier, we, we went through Yokata, Japan, and mm -hmm. I saw these guys coming over then, and we were on our way home, and I was medevac. I was on a stretcher and whatever, and, and they had us alongside the, uh, the same fence that I walked in earlier, and I thought, wow, those guys look young. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I get on the C-141, we refuel in Anchorage. They got us stacked up like cordwood, okay? Mm -hmm. And I was in good shape. I could walk if I had to. I was mm -hmm. on crutches, but I could walk. Uh, and there were guys there missing limbs and whatever. Mm -hmm. But there, I think there were four high on a C-141. And I think we were stacked four high. And we're coming from Anchorage now going to St. Louis, Missouri, to an air base south of St. Louis, Missouri. And these guys wanted to know, when are we over the world? You know, this was the world. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, and we knew what the total flight time was from Anchorage to St. Louis. Mm -hmm. And so... Uh, we said, uh, those guys are by the window. You can't tell from Canada to the U.S. where the border is. And so if it was a six-hour flight, you know, we said after three hours, mm -hmm. we, us guys by the window said, we'll tell them we're over the world. And so we said, hey, we're over the world, you know, the U.S. And so the screams went up. And I thought, man, ain't that something? So now we come into St. Louis to this air base. And as the plane is coming in on the runway, you got to imagine now, here's a medevac plane all... Oh, Mm -hmm. Stacked up like, you know, and, and somebody up front, as your plane is coming in on the runway, I don't know if it was the pilot or co-pilot, he came over the PA system and he says, gentlemen, welcome to the United States of America. Oh, mm -hmm. baby. The screams that went up then. That was something. Now you get to St. Louis. Was there a military hospital there where yeah. they had you kind of in rehab? And No, I processed out pretty quick okay. and we, I went to Ireland Army Hospital. And where is that? Fort Knox. Okay, so you go. And then my wife-to-be came down there and visited. Mm -hmm. Now, once, how long did it take you to recover from all of that? Um, I don't recall exactly. I'm going to say it was a couple weeks. Mm -hmm. um, a couple, maybe three weeks. And I did, I did physical therapy, basically, to, mm -hmm. to get my legs so I could walk without crutches. And I guess for a short period of time, I walked with a little limp and whatever. And I ended up doing therapy. And, Okay. Now, at the end of that, do they discharge you, or do they have to keep you in the army? They longer? did. Okay. No, nope. I was discharged. Uh, I think the date was April 23rd of '69, and I got hit actually the second time was February 17th of '69. So okay, so a couple months total there. Yep. Uh, for all of that happened, and I guess you were close enough to the end of your enlistment and so forth that at that point they yep. will just discharge people. Yep. So I tell people I was only in a total of 18 months, and I was only in Nam actually six months mm -hmm. approximately. Yep. All right. Uh, now, once you got back home, you discharged, what do you do? Well, um, I actually was home on leave before I got discharged. Mm -hmm. My dad worked at uh, this large furniture manufacturer we have in Grand Rapids area. And my dad said, I was on crutches, and he said, um, um, would you like a tour of the, of the furniture company? And I mm -hmm. said, no, not really. And I didn't plan on ever working there. And so I said, no, I got buddies around. Well, my buddies were all working or going to school or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so after a couple of days, my dad says, I can set up this tour. And so he fixed up a tour, and I did a tour of, of this office furniture manufacturer. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did that, and uh, I was introduced to the, the president and CEO on that. And because I was on crutches, the guy that took me on the tour took me on a golf cart mm -hmm. through the plant, basically. But then when I went to the front office, uh, we walked up there, and I was on crutches, and then he introduced me as as just getting back from Vietnam mm -hmm. and, and still being in the military at that time. Mm -hmm. And he introduced me to the president and CEO, and I thought that was pretty neat. And then little did I know, but I did end up working there. Mm -hmm. uh, a, a month or so later, I had a chance to work there, and I went there, and I ended up working there 38 years. So, Okay. It's okay to tell us who they are. Was it Steelcase or somebody else? It is. Yeah. It is Steelcase. All right. Yep, and I met Frank Marlotti and, uh, and Bob Pugh. Yep. Mm -hmm. 
All right. Uh, and how long before you got married? I got married that next November, November 21st. Ooh, I got an anniversary coming up. Yep. All right. Um, now, once you, you got back... And my wife's wedding dress came from the Philippines. Not that. So that tied in there, you know. Right. Anyway, I'm sorry. All right. Uh, once you got back, uh, did, did people ask you much about what it was like in Vietnam, or did you talk much about that? They did. And they, uh, you know, we didn't, do, do, we didn't get a whole lot of debriefing. But they told us, what I do recall was they told us to talk about it a lot mm -hmm. um, now and then be done with it. And so I had a, a friend of mine who, uh, I grew up right down the street from this guy who was now a teacher, mm -hmm. uh, teaching geography at Zealand High School. Ken Postman is his name. And I remember going to, uh, to his class and talking about Vietnam and showing mm -hmm. my slides. I had slides, which are now my wife had made into mm -hmm. this DVD. But right. anyway, I remember going there and talking about it. And I talked about it. Um, to my family and whatever back then. Um, but I have three children now, and it's just not something that I've ever really talked about with my kids. Mm -hmm. well, now they can. I mean, I have, but, yeah. you know, nothing serious. All right. Um, did you, once you got back, did you notice much or pay much attention to kind of the anti-war movement and the stuff going on then? I didn't see that. I really didn't, because I was in the hospital and in yeah. uh, but I meant just sort of general, you're, you're out of the military oh, yeah. there and then you're oh, watching yeah, TV. Oh, yeah, I saw that in the paper and whatever, yeah, yeah. Do you have a re reaction or a response to all of that? No, I really don't. Um, I'm kind of a neutral kind of guy, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, I understand where these people are coming from. Mm -hmm. I really do. Um, and, you know, the little paper I wrote about my trip back and when we came in and landed and, mm -hmm. and, and the pilot says, gentlemen, welcome to the United States of America, and then, er, er, you know, mm -hmm. um, Uh, I don't know where I was going with this right now, but anyway, my feeling, my feeling was, um, I understood where they were coming from, I guess. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, what do you think now about sort of the way, the kind of response that uh, the guys coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan are getting? It's kind of a different quality probably from I think Vietnam. it's pretty neat. I really do. Mm -hmm. I salute them. And it's neat. We just had Veterans Day and... and you know, now people come up and tell me thanks for serving mm -hmm. and that kind of stuff, and it's pretty neat. Yeah. We learned something after a while anyway, yeah. out of Vietnam. Yeah. Now, for yourself, if you kind of think back to the time that uh, you spent in the Army, how do you think that affected you? you? Were you different when you came out, or had you learned anything? Yeah, I, I learned a lot about myself. Um, I, I changed a lot. I mean, um, at first I was really cool under pressure. Mm -hmm. um, and then when I went back out in the field that second time, um, the first time we had contact, I, I wasn't so cool. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was, I still remember the trembling when I grabbed the horn from my radio man, mm -hmm. you know, and he said, hey, Sarge, it's for you. And I remember, I remember okay. shaking in the middle of the night. Um, but, but then again, later on, I think I, I regained that composure mm -hmm. in, in tough times. Uh, but I'm not, I'm, I never was the type, kind of guy to make waves, you know, and mm -hmm. I've tried to do the middle of the road kind of thing. Yeah. You know, I, I can understand, I try to understand both viewpoints. Mm -hmm. And I can understand why people went to Canada, you know, uh, and I can understand why, why our president allowed them to come back. Okay, mm -hmm. I can understand that. I really, I really tried to anyway. Mm -hmm. So you come out of it, you're accommodating of, of the world, or you're not judgmental, I guess. I guess you could say that, yeah. 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 yeah, but I don't know, on the whole, you seem to have come out really pretty well. Yeah, I think so. And, and ultimately, you're able to tell your story well, and there's a lot in here that people are going to learn from. So I'd like to close this out just by thanking you for coming in and talking to me today. Well, thank you. I appreciate it.